Hi, um, I'm Sandra Wachter. I'm a researcher in data ethics at the Alan Turing Institute. And what I'm going to do today is walk you through a couple of interests, uh, research interests that I have, starting with my past, then with the present research that I'm doing at the Institute, and the future research that I'm hoping to do at the Institute. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about my past. I'll give you a bit about my background. I have a master's and a PhD in law. In my master's, I focused on medical law, um, biomedicine law, and pharmaceutical law. During my PhD, I expanded my scope and was focusing more on the technological side of things. So looking at European law, tech law, and international law. I also have a Master of Science from the Oxford Internet Institute, where I studied the social implications of technology, um, digital technology for society. So this is where my research interest in ethics comes to play. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about my PhD project because this is the reason why I started working here. And I think some of the things that I did in my PhD feed into the work that the ATI is doing. Um, what I did in my PhD was, um, uh, the title was a European Data Retention Directive and the Concept of Democracy According to the European um, Court of Human Rights. Um, and my PhD so I focused on European law, international law, tech law, human rights, and data protection law. These were the areas that I covered. And just to give you a couple of research questions that I focused on, I'm not going to walk you through all of that, I'm just going to focus on the last one because this is the most relevant one. But the basis was I wanted to figure out what is a democracy. Um, was a rather challenging endeavor, to be honest. And I wanted to answer a philosophical, ethical question with a legal approach, basically. I also asked the question how technology is changing how we live democracy and whether it's a threat, whether it's merit, whether it's beneficial. Um, also, I asked the question whether surveillance methods such as the European Data Retention Directive are compatible with the concept of democracy. And the most important question that I focused on was what is the actual value of privacy for the individual and for society? So this is the research question that I'm going to be focusing on. Now, I'm going to show you what I found. Um, but first, about the method that I used um, to approach this problem. What I did is I analyzed the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights because, as I said, I wanted to have a legal basis for a question that I wanted to be answered. Um, the European Court of Human Rights is an international court with jurisprudence um, jurisdiction over 47 member states. So whatever the court rules will be applicable in all of these member states. So the basis what the court thinks about democracy and privacy has universal applicability around Europe. So it is like it gives value and gives a broad understanding of what we think about these values. Um, also really interesting with regard to the jurisprudence is that the judgment show a really clear inter uh, interlocutability between uh, democracy and human rights. So you can actually see how this work together. I'm not going to walk you through how I found the, um, the definition of democracy according to the court, but to give you the free, the whole the trinity of democracy basically is pluralism, tolerance, and broad-mindedness. I'm going to focus on pluralism because this is where privacy comes into play. So if you think about democracy, you have to think that pluralism and democracy are basically synonyms that need to be considered as one entity. Um, so the basic scope of privacy in terms of the jurisprudence of the court is privacy is about the free development of your ability and your personality. It is to give you a free space that is not monitored, where you can freely exercise human rights, your personality, engage with other people, um, build relationships with friends and family, have a family of your own, um, have a home that is sacred, that is not monitored, where you can actually rewind and you know, um, have a secure environment for that. Also, what's important is that privacy is about self-fulfillment in terms of finding a profession that you love um, and building business relationships. So all of that is the basic scope of privacy according to the jurisprudence. And if you think about the basic elements, it all shows that these are tools to develop a pluralistic personality. If you have the freedom to develop yourself in, and you know, develop your capabilities, you're going to be a diverse person. And diversity means pluralism, and this is the concept of democracy. But this is not all what privacy does. 
Um, if, you th if you think about other important human rights that are enshrined in the Convention of Human Rights, we can see that some level of privacy needs to be protected in order to fully exercise them. Um, for example, Article 2 of the first protocol is the right to education. In order to get information to order to inform your mind about something or to hold an opinion, you need to have a safe space where you can actually access information and make sense of the of, uh, of, of documents that you have available. If you think about spirituality, Article 9, for example, is the freedom of thought, religion and conscience. Religion is often, uh, religious beliefs are often, yeah, often, often offers ground for discrimination. So if you don't um, being discriminated against because you have certain belief systems or if you're part of a certain church, that can actually have an influence on how you exercise religion. Um, Article 10, for example, is freedom of expression. So all communication rights, that means holding private conversation with people. That is also freedom of press, for example. It's freedom of art, freedom of science, freedom of academia and the access to information. Also here, we need some kind of privacy, especially if we look, for example, at the free press. Confidentiality between uh, journalists and sources is highly important. Um, also, if you're accessing information on the internet to form an opinion, it's pre preferable if you're not being monitored to do that, rather than doing that. Another really important human right is Article 11. It's the right to form an assembly and the the, the right to join unions, so some kind of solidarity. Political activism is also something that often offers ground for discrimination. So you might don't want your political partnership or your to the fact that you're a member of political party to be displayed to the public, because political belief is also something that should be considered private. Um, the same comes true for Article 1 of this first protocol, that's the right to vote. Um, secret election is something that most democrats democracy you agree upon is something that's essential to keep democracy alive, basically. So we can see that all these human rights that are really important for democracy need some kind of privacy in order to function. And again, all of these human rights are essential in order to express your personality, that personality that needs privacy in order to flourish. So again, we can see that the development and the expression of these human rights contribute to the prolific um, personality that the court wants to see. Just quickly on the on the tech side of things, um, what I also did in my PhD was focusing on how we use technology. I don't think we need to talk about much how we now exercise um, freedom of expression. We use Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of that to express our personalities. It's also a tool to communicate with our friends and family. Um, electronic means are being used for businesses all the time to communicate with each other. It's also facilitating uh, because it's faster, it's more cost efficient. Um, communication basically runs using digital te um, technologies. Um, also in terms of solidarity, um, a lot of online protests are being organized using the internet, for example, and online voting or online um, uh, petitions, for example, so we use technology in order to exercise political rights. But all of that, of course, leaves a digital trace behind that is the payoff when we use technology. So for example, if you think about geolocation data, I can track you down. And if I know your geolocation data, I know if you went actually, if you, if you did cast a vote, because I can see if you went to the po polling station. I can also see if you um, joined the mess on Sunday, so I can figure out whether you're Christian or not. Um, I can track down how often you're um, meeting your CEO or your other business partners using ge geo data. So, it's always something that has to be considered when we talk about technology. So, the last slide about my PhD project is, I've tried to think about how we can actually protect privacy in the digital age. Um, the most important things are four things that I think they need to be considered. It's, first of all, privacy means not being discriminated in the sense of we need to secure freedom and tolerance. So states, member states have to put safeguards in place that encourage people to develop their abilities to express themselves and at the same time put laws into force that, in, <clears throat> that secure that nobody is discriminated. 
Um, a second thing that comes into place is that privacy is really closely connected to informational self-determination. That means that I'm in control of the data that I own and I can be the one that um, determines whether I want to share it or not. So give some, you know, give, give control to the data owner in, in that sense. Um, other positive obligations of states would be putting laws or safeguards in place to actually enforce that and also competing interests that need to be considered because um, there are other public interests, maybe third party interests that need to be considered when we talk about privacy. So this is what I did in my PhD and now what I'm doing at the ATI. Um, what I'm doing is looking at um, legal and ethical aspects of algorithm machine learning and big data and I've listed here the things that I did in my PhD and all of that is applicable to um, the different areas where we can see uh, where big, big data is applied at the moment. So all of these things, that, uh, according to a couple of studies that I looked at, these are the areas where big data is likely to be used. Um, one interesting um, sector is, of course, healthcare sector. Big data can do amazing things in that. It helps us for drug discovery, detecting um, diseases, making prediction um, about treatment plans, which is amazing, but dealing with sensitive data such as medical data also raises immense problems with regard to privacy. Um, also, if you think about automated decision making processes uh, using uh, machine learning, um, for example, applying for private insurance and them being rejected, how can we make sure that there are no discrimination in that regard? How can we make sure that data subjects have actually the right to compete that decision that has been made about them? Um, also, another interesting area of big data application is the workplace. Um, there are a lot of things that are, a lot of routine and mundane tasks that can be automated using algorithms, for example, which is great because nobody wants to do that. But at the same time, we're getting rid of jobs. Do we think about the ethical implication that it actually means that we are continuously automating all the workforce? Um, do we need to put some safeguards in place to guard against these risks? Also, evaluating employees' risks assessment and uh, performance evaluation using algorithms could be tricky if we don't know what the algorithm is actually doing. So opening up the black box, making sure that there is no discrimination, that all competing interests are equally valued, and to give the data subject some kind of um, remedy if it feels um, discriminated as something that is important. And to do all of that, I try to look at safeguards. So what I'm doing is I'm analyzing and evaluating the legal framework that is in place right now and think about, do we need to adopt it? Do we need to change that? Do we need to create new legal framework that hasn't been considered at all? And what kind of legal tools are we actually using to make it feasible? Do we want soft law? in the sense of do we want like code of conduct, do we want the private sector to make this decision, do we want a multi-stakeholder approach, do we want legislators to do that, do we want the European Union to do that, or maybe the United Nations, or should the UK just focus on themselves, um, do we want self-regulation, what's the merit in that, what can, like, or do we want hard law, and if we want hard law, where do we actually change things, do we do it on the privacy side and try to strengthen data protection and privacy law, do we look at cyber, cyber security laws that needs to be adopted in order to protect privacy? Or do we need to look at the human rights um, that are concerned in that regard, or human dignity even? Or do we need to control the tech sector and look at the tech law that is in place? Or is it more about um, transparency and liability and accountability laws? Is that the angle to evaluate all of that? So this is what I'm doing now. What I'm planning to do in the future, what I'm hoping to do in the future, is shaping policy and legislation from an academic viewpoint. So being here at the, at the ATI gives me the opportunity to work with as many researchers as possible to have an interdisciplinary collaboration to talk with researchers what kind of challenges they are facing when they're doing their research. Raising awareness about the implications of what their research actually does to society. So what I want to do is raise awareness with writing papers, also with workshop lectures and conferences to actually put my finger on the, on the problems that we're having, but not just to create more problems, I also want to produce um, solutions and therefore 
come up with recommendations or even guidelines um, to make sure that privacy um, is protected even in the 21st century. Thank you. Um, well, I sure hope so. Um, I, I don't think there's a solution like a one-fits-all solution. I think the most promising thing would be to, to look at these things on a case-to-case -case basis. I think um, it really depends on the area that you're looking at. So, for example, if you're in healthcare, there are different um, risks that you have to evaluate whether than you just using the Internet of Things regarding your home, for example, just, you know, emission reduction and all of that. So there are different risks, basically. And I think it's important that we, that we are aware that there are different risks involved so that legislators and judges, if they make the decision, actually take this into account. So I don't think there is like a solution that fits all, but it needs to be differentiated on different levels. One risks, yeah. um, have you thought about thought how this fits into things like that? In terms of... Um, just like generally, because I mean, Sources to be the, the true way. I know, and I get that, and I think that's that's an interesting thought. But I mean, to me, freedom and democracy does not mean being skilled at dodging surveillance. It means being free and open to use technology and not being super skilled at having like encryption tools to sneak around. Because actually, there is nothing. If 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 government or if if they decide to surveil us, they have to go for a quick reason and not the other way around. Um, well, from what's interesting about this is that we are going to face new um, data protection legislation in about two years with the GDPR that is coming into force. And they are actually trying to take those things into account because they're encouraging the private sector to develop technically feasible and reliable tools to ensure data privacy and actually like encouraging that kind of approach to privacy. So I think that's something that's going to be adopted. Also, in addition to that, there will be for certain technologies um, a mandatory privacy impact assessment. So we actually have to make an assessment before you start the data processing to figure out how much is the impact of my research project going to have on society. And this is where this would come into place, where you can actually use these tools to make an assessment before you start your research. Talking about the impact of the research would have on society. Yeah. And obviously, you've been talking about protecting privacy, so I suppose it's avoiding negative impacts. Yeah. But obviously, I guess a lot of us hope that things that we're doing will have positive impacts as well. Yeah. So, do you, I suppose you concluded on the point that you're, you're hoping to be able to come up with approaches that allow us to protect privacy yes. in the 21st century. Do you also see part of your goal as trying to minimize opportunity costs? as well because as you said with, with healthcare for example yeah. there is all sorts of um uh, good things that we can that we can do with this data and so a key goal is to make sure that you know in my in my mind that's that's surely got to be something important that we i totally do. agree and i think the most important thing is that we're balancing interests and one of the most like a public interest is healthcare, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But in order to balance the, the interest of a data subject and the public in, uh, interest of health, we need, to, for example, encryption tools that actually work. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and trying to shape policy to encourage researchers to work with that, raising awareness on how to do that properly. That would be something. I'm not. I'm not saying that privacy as an absolute right. It needs to be balanced against other important things. That's. I'm just trying to say. Um, What's important for me is that privacy is not just about data protection because it's just a buzzword that nobody really understands. But if you think about more what privacy actually means for the individual and society, this must be factored in if you're making a decision about disclosing data, for example, and what the ramifications of data breaches actually have on the individual and society.